My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and you're watching Singularity FM, the place where we interview the future. Speaking of the future, we all know that embodied artificial intelligence will definitely play a huge role in it, and so I'm extremely happy to welcome today the CTO and founder of a brand new startup company which is coming out of stealth mode with the explicit goal of developing embodied artificial intelligence. So, Suzanne Gildert, thank you very much for being with us today. Thanks for having me on your show. I've been an avid follower for many years. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's, that's totally true. And you've been supporter, you've been follower. Mm -hmm. it's, I'm always amazed and, and kind of flabbergasted and humbled to have people of your quality and your status and, and your kind of work and knowledge and skill set as members of my audience. So thank you for that. No problem. <laughs> it's, 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 it's incredibly humbling and also very motivating. Mm -hmm. Uh, but of course, today we are here to talk about you and what you do. So let me start with my traditional first question, which is always, if you were to introduce yourself in a couple of sentences, what's the best way to do that? Who is Suzanne Gildert? Uh, well, I am a scientist, I am an engineer, um, I am a maker, and I am an artist. So, wow. <laughs> a lot of things. It's interesting how you cover the whole spectrum. So let me just try and pick up a couple of words and see if there's any importance or interplay between the artist and the scientist and the engineer and the maker. Is the artistic part of Suzanne helping the engineering part and the science part of Suzanne and, and, and how if it is? I think it definitely is. I think when you, when you build something, you shouldn't only think about how it functions and what it does and how well it's going to do that task. I think you should also think about how it looks and how it's going to make people feel. And art is all about, you know, making people feel emotions, maybe sometimes emotions they're uncomfortable with or that pushes them to a different place, a different way of thinking. And I think the things we build in technology should be like that too. I think they should make people, you know, awe-inspired or evoke some kind of emotional reaction as well as just a pure, oh, this is a gadget that like is for a task and it makes my life better. I think it should also move people on a deeper level. So art's very important for engineering. That, that's fantastic. So let's be a little more specific here and uh, uh, give people the, the sort of the background or the content of both your science and your art. So uh, in scientific terms, you're a PhD in theoretical physics? Uh, experimental physics. Experimental yeah. physics. There you go. So tell us a little bit more about that. Right. Well, I think the reason I ended up with this science art dichotomy was because my mother was an artist. And my, my father was, well, he was very interested in science and electronics. So from an early age, I was exposed to both these fields. And I was always trying to come up with a way to merge them or bring them together, or um, at least not have them in conflict in my life. So I've always had this sort of, um, you know, both sides of the coin there. Uh, and I didn't want to pursue art as a career because I sort of knew from an early age that that's difficult. It's hard to make money as an artist. It's hard to make a living. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to go into science, which I was very passionate about, and always keep the art as a hobby. Uh, that's what my, my parents recommended I did, and it's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> but now I've actually been able to find a way to weave the art back into the science. So I think it's, yeah, it's definitely been a big part of my life. That's phenomenal. So tell us a little bit about your art. What kind of art do you do? Mm -hmm. So, well, I've done a variety of different things throughout my life, um, primarily painting and drawing and uh, digital painting specifically. So up until a few years ago, I did a lot of uh, fancy, dark and gothic digital painting, um, wow. exploring themes such as uh, angels and demons. And the specific wow. theme I explored the most was... Um, Things that are on the surface beautiful, but have a darker nugget within them, or on the surface appear ugly or difficult to understand or sort of darker, but have something really good or meaningful or pure inside them. So I like playing with those two, um, those two themes. The dichotomies, the contrasts. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, on, you might see an angel, 
in one of these paintings, but there's something very dark going on in that. Or there may be something that's like a, a monster or a demon, but there's something very, uh, very good or pure that's, uh, that's inside that. Very interesting. So we'll, we'll definitely come back to that dichotomy and that sort of interesting um, tension, if you will. Mm. But so tell me, you started with sort of art and science through uh, experimental physics, and then you end up in artificial intelligence. Yep. <laughs> so share with us a little bit about that journey and not mm -hmm. only in artificial intelligence, but it also as a founder of a major uh, company that we're going mm -hmm. to be discussing just mm -hmm. in a second uh, and, and a chief technology officer. So share, us first, share with us first about that journey. Right. What led you and how did you get to where you are today? Yeah. Well, I think my original passion for science came from like, Working with my dad, he, he used to show me electronic circuits and how to build them. And I remember once uh, being very excited because he woke me up in the middle of the night, or at least I, it felt like the middle of the night. I don't think it really was. It was like <laughs> 8 p.m. or something. And he, he, um, he told me, watch, this is very interesting. And he had a circuit board that he was etching, a little printed circuit board. He was etching using ferric chloride in, in a little bath. And I just remember watching this and thinking it was the most fascinating thing I'd ever seen in my wow. life. Like this circuit was emerging from this, um, from this piece of copper. And like ever since then I was hooked. So he made like metal detectors and like hobby electronics things. And I always loved electronics and science because of that. So I decided to pursue that. Um, at university. Uh, the way then I kind of transitioned into quantum physics was again being very interested in electronics. I was very interested in devices and transistors and how they worked. And as you go further and further down in scale with those devices, you end up at the quantum level. So my thinking was, if I want to understand physics, I have to understand that very most fundamental level Definitely. <laughs> so of, the, of those devices. Um, I did that and it was very cool and interesting and I loved quantum physics research, but I still always had this desire to really build things. I wanted to build proper, real big scale processes that actually, you know, did, we used for real That's the difference between an experimental world. physicist and a theoretical physicist, yeah. I think, right? Yeah. yeah. So my favorite parts of experimental physics were being hands-on in the lab, actually really building things, measuring things, and improving things. Mm -hmm. um, the, the quantum devices I, were working, I was working with during my PhD research were very small. They were kind of like the single transistor equivalent <laughs> in a quantum computer. So I was engineering a little tiny part of a single transistor, and I kind of started to realize if I ever wanted to build a larger scale processor or ever see a quantum computer uh, come to life, I was going to have to start working on a different scale. Yeah. So that's when I started learning a bit about D-Wave and what they were doing. And when I found out about this company, I was like, wow, they're actually building not just one transistor and optimizing that. They already built a whole processor with thousands of these transistors on it, of these quantum transistor equivalents called Josephson junctions. So I was just like kind of captivated by that technology and I knew at that point I had to work there. Uh, it was interesting though, at the same time, I actually started reading a lot about intelligence. Mm -hmm. I read a book called On Intelligence by Jeff Hawkins. Mm -hmm. It was around 2009 yeah. and that was a real eye opener for me because it was the first time I'd really thought about intelligence and that it might be algorithmically definable. Mm -hmm. And the, the book was so elegantly written in terms of a sort of a, 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 a uni, almost a universal theory of cognition that I was Absolutely. like, wow, this is amazing. So then I started to get interested in neural nets and because I was doing quantum physics, I got interested in quantum neural nets. Mm -hmm. And then that's how, sort of how I transitioned to, into AI. So you're originally from Bristol? Um, I'm originally from Manchester and Manchester. I went to school in Birmingham. Oh, in Birmingham. Yeah. Okay, great. And yeah. then you made the trip all the way from the UK to the West Coast yes. in North America in Canada. It, it's, a, it's quite a long way. It is, yeah, yeah. It was, it was difficult. I mean, I had, to, I had to move house. I had to leave behind all, the, all my friends very near and dear and my family and basically start a new life in a place that I'd never... Well, I had been to before, but I'd never lived there. How many before. years did you spend with D-Wave? Uh, four. Four yeah. years. Yeah. Right. And you know, the interesting thing of that is that about four years ago, uh, we were already kind of mm -hmm. in touch with you uh, 
through my sort of podcast uh, network. And about that time, I did an interview with Jordi Rhodes, who is the CTO of D-Wave, of course. And it's funny that his parting message was, machine intelligence is closer than you think. <laughs> and now this mm -hmm. makes a lot more sense because you left D-Wave around that time mm -hmm. and to do what? So I left D-Wave to start a new company. Uh, the company is now Kindred. Um, it's been going for about two and a half years. And it was through thinking about AI so much that I realized I was, I was just so passionate about the intelligence and the AI side of things. And the, the quantum computing, whilst it was still really cool, was um, the computers we were building were just tools. Mm -hmm. And they were tools to answer questions. But what I really started thinking about was what are those questions that we need to ask? And so moving into AI was a way of working on the defining those questions and figuring out the algorithms that we could then go back and use these kind of supercomputers and quantum computers to optimize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pablo yeah. Picasso, I think, was the person who said computers are very stupid. They can only give you answers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and to me personally, as a philosopher, my personal Turing test for smart machines would be I don't care about the answers. Give me a good question. Yes. And I think exactly. you're kind of pushing into that direction right now. So lead us further into mm -hmm. that journey, please. Yeah. So at, um, while I was at D-Wave, I, I worked with quite a lot of machine learning researchers. We had a network of, of, of machine learning people from around the world that we've been talking to for a while. Mm -hmm. And I kind of got more and more interested in the subfield of AI that's yeah. known as machine learning. Yeah. And I developed some quantum machine learning applications while mm -hmm. at D-Wave. Um, amongst a few other kind of quantum software things in general. So, so yeah, I was working on that. And what I started to realize was that machine learning and specifically deep learning was advancing faster than anyone had predicted. And so I was watching these advancements sort of from the sideline. As you might imagine every month or so, there was a new paper coming out. There was something else in the news about deep learning and, and how it was going to take over the world and be the next big thing. And I'd already been thinking about intelligence and wanting to do something. So I was like, I have to get on board this train because it's leaving now. Yes. And at that point, I was already thinking it might be too late. This, this, might be, mm -hmm. this time might be too late to start something. You know, people mm -hmm. are already way ahead with this. Um, so at that point, I decided I have to quit my job and do this other thing because I can keep talking about it all I want, but I'm never going to actually do it unless I just take the plunge and then start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so here we are today. You have been in stealth mode for two, two and a half years yeah, now. That's right. So tell us the, the sort of the the scoop on Kindred AI. Mm -hmm. What is the company uh, all about? Uh, who are the major team players? Uh, where do you get the funding for it? And things like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, Kindred was founded with the explicit mission of creating human-like intelligence in machines. So that was our mission from the outset. It still is today. And we're still trying to pursue that vision. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a kind of a long-term vision. Yeah. And in, in fact, the founding of Kindred, uh, myself and my co-founders were sort of inspired by some of these more mission-driven organizations, um, you, like Tesla and SpaceX are obvious examples, but there are many companies like this where they are trying to build products, but they also have this more longer-term mission, which is what everyone in the company feels um, very strongly and they're very passionate about. Right. And those kind of companies will endure hardships they will like push the state of the art and they will create new innovations because everyone's so yeah. passionate about the mission uh, at silicon valley people call that massively transformative purpose yeah so uh, things like organize the world's information mm -hmm. solve intelligence um uh, solve humanity's grand challenges. Those are such yeah. examples. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. So we had this uh, this like mission and vision, but there was something else which was I, I, so I wouldn't have, have started it unless there was like a clear technological path as well. Because um, I think having a, <laughs> the strategy is very important before you just sort of jump and start something. So it was when we had both the vision, the visionary, um, far future looking mission and a clear 
path of how to get there that made sense. So mm -hmm. that was when it all clicked for me. And the, the path that we took to get there is based on three technological advancements, I'd say, or three technological paths. Mm -hmm. The first one is robotics, specifically humanoid robotics, mm -hmm. although we do do some other things with different types of robots. Um, so the, the reason that that technology was coming into place for me was um, the fact that the cost of sensors and hardware and motors and 3D printing and firmware platforms was all coming down and it was getting increasingly easier and yeah. cheaper to build a robot from scratch yeah. in, in, in the lab or in your garage or whatever in like three days. <laughs> so when people think of classical robotics, these kind of robots that you see in manufacturing now are big, they're um, sort of cumbersome, they're very expensive, they're very specialized. And we saw very ugly industrial yeah, design look going industrial, back to your yeah. artistic sort of exactly. take on things. <laughs> and we saw an opportunity for building small robots fast with a rapid iteration cycle, like rapidly mm -hmm. changing the hardware as we found new sensors and things that were becoming available. And we were able to build um, sort of a variety of different robots very, very quickly. I mm -hmm. think we built something like 12 generations within the first year. Wow. Um, that we were operating. So yeah, there was like a new robot coming out every few Every weeks. month. So, wow. Yeah, it was pretty good. Uh, so yeah, that was the first thing we noticed. The second thing was the ability to move and around and store large quantities of data, specifically over networks. Mm -hmm. So this was the sort of second technology track we had. Mm -hmm. So one of, the, um, one of the technologies we use is something called immersive tally operation, which is where a human uh, uses either a full exosuit or some devices that they hold and a head-up display they look through to immerse themselves in the robot's body and be able to control it. Right. Um, if you've seen the movie Surrogates, Surrogates that's yeah, like with Bruce a, Willis. The, the kind of limiting case yes, of where this exactly. might go eventually. Um, but yeah, we, we have sort of primitive versions of this compared to that movie now that we use to control the robots. And all the data that comes from the humans performing tasks mm -hmm. is very good quality training data for machine learning algorithms because the robots are essentially doing exactly what you'd want them to do if they were human-like. So all that training data is very high quality and we can store it all and we can actually teleoperate robots now in real time wow. because we have such awesome like networking platforms opening yes. up and things like 5G coming along. It just like makes everything easier. So, so the, bit, the sort of... I don't really like the word big data, but, but <laughs> yeah. in this case, it really does apply because you've got like terabytes Absolutely, of data yeah. coming Constantly, from these robots per second robots, maybe. Yeah, being stored. So, so that big data is the second one. The third technology track was advanced machine learning algorithms mm -hmm. that were just being discovered at What do you do that with time. that data? Yeah, it's what do you do How with How do data? you learn? Yeah from that data. Yeah, because you have all this, this data and right. you want to actually get some kind of action out Knowledge. of it, some value out of it. And apply so, it, yes. Yeah. So what we do is we use all that data to train the, 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 the latest um, machine learning, uh, using latest machine learning techniques, specifically certain kinds of neural nets is our, is our focus. Mm -hmm. And what we try and do is get those neural nets to reproduce what the type of data that they were shown. Mm -hmm. um, and if you kind of take this to its logical extreme, what it means is you're able to train a robot to do any task that a human's able to show it. Mm -hmm. and it will be able to then do that task autonomously. So the way that process works is basically the human performs first, you collect the data, you upload the data, you run some machine learning algorithms, try to extrapolate or learn or mm -hmm. translate the data into machine language and see if the machines can extrapolate some kind of a pattern. Yep. and discern how to perform the task in their own way with similar or the same results. Yes. Is yep. that that's, kind of the si super simplistic way. way of describing yep. it? That's one way you can do it, where you collect all the data first, mm -hmm. and then you train, and then you run. Mm -hmm. There's a second mode, which is called online learning, where the model is training at, at the same time as the data is streaming in. So you can actually have the um, AI getting smarter, like whilst the... Simultaneously. Yeah. Yeah, wow. so we've been looking at, we, we look at both those, those ways of doing it, yeah. Wow, very, very interesting. Let me zoom back just a little bit and ask you here, what's your biggest dream? <laughs> um, well, I personally would like to see a world where uh, in our lifetimes we have 
non-biological sentiences living amongst us. So I, I dream of a world where um, there, are, there are humans, there are other animals, mammals, there are you know, reptiles and insects, but there's another entire species, uh, not species, <laughs> um, genus or phylus or whatever the name is of mm -hmm. that. I'm not very good on the, uh, <laughs> on the biology biological side. evolution. Yeah, me yes, too. Yes, but another entirely new kind sort of section of of, um, of these animals, and, but they are just non-biological. They yeah. are essentially robots, if you want to call them robots. But they may not be robots in the way people think of when they think about robots. They're essentially machine creatures. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to see those kind of things being part of our world. And um, why is that so exciting for you? Why, why is that? having such an appeal and such yeah. pull on you? So there's, there's a couple of reasons. Um, one is that I think everything that the human civilization has done up to now has been done in the same way. We've, you know, we are humans and we use our brains to create things and then we do things that like help humans and uh, everything has been made by humans. And I just think if there is a world where there is another species that can also use tools and make new things and mm -hmm. progress science and technology in the way that humans do. That is a huge resource and I think it would be like an upgrade to our civilization if we had uh, a, hel a helping or a symbiotic species with us and they would have different traits to us for example they could have their minds could be connected together so they could operate more as a small collectives. Mm -hmm. um, whenever they needed to and then break away. So a good example of this is, uh, if, if I can tell a short anecdote. Sure. When I was working in physics, I remember very specifically having a light bulb moment. <laughs> <laughs> and um, which is one of the reasons I decided to go into AI. And what I was doing was I, I'd just been doing a, an experiment on the, uh, on the apparatus that I was using to measure the samples. And I went back to my desk and I was trying to understand the theory behind the experiment I was doing. And I remember looking through this theory and it was pages and pages of math and there were these complex things called Green's functions. And I just remember staring at them and you know the symbols started to move around and I was like, I don't understand any of this. And wow. at that moment I started thinking, why, why are human brains like mine trying to do this when they're obviously not designed to natively manipulate these kind of uh, equations and make these sort of breakthroughs theoretically. Data. Now some people can do it, but it's getting increasingly fewer and fewer as the science gets more and more complex. Mm -hmm. So the light bulb moment was maybe my, my time and resources is better spent trying to build machines Mm -hmm. that can understand and do these things better than we can. Get somebody else yeah. to do the heavy lifting. Yeah. Essentially artificial scientists. Absolutely. I think science is, it's been amazing what we're able to do, but imagine what, uh, what we could do in science if, say, we weren't limited by a group or a network of biologists having to read every single paper that was published. Mm -hmm. it, I don't think it's even possible now. It's not. Yeah. If you had an AI that could keep track and read every single paper and amass all that knowledge and draw conclusions from it, we'd probably be able to cure cancer. You know, this is what medical quicker. AI is like Watson do nowadays, right? Yeah. Which is why on average yeah. they do much better than the average oncologist. Yeah. Because exactly. the average oncologist, even with 20 or 30 years of experience, would never have the chance to stay abreast of the thousands of new papers and research coming out mm -hmm. all the time, whereas someone like Watson certainly can. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so that, that's a great point, but uh, let me ask you though, the biggest fear of some people is that that kind of a beautiful scenario when you, where, where you painted us working harmoniously or cohabiting peacefully together and alongside mm -hmm. the robots would be a utopia because there are people like um, Elon Musk who said it's like summoning the demon. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Stephen Hawking said it may be uh, our final, our last invention, and of course James Barrett has a phenomenal book mm -hmm. called Our Final Invention. So, aren't you concerned about those fears mm -hmm. that we may be bringing our own end, our own death, our own replacements? Mm -hmm. So, I think the way I think about this is it's not going to be one extreme or the other. So, I think people like to think in black and white terms, like 
I don't like the term utopia because I don't think anything mm -hmm. will ever be a utopia, and, but I also don't think it will be the, the worst case dystopia. dystopian yeah. sci-fi scenario you can think of. I think it'll be somewhere in between, but more on the good end of the spectrum for, for humanity. Um, I do agree that this is something we need to be thinking about now because these, these things are being developed. I mean, whether it's Kindred or another company, it's happening. Deep and, learning, for example. Yeah, and even not even AI. I mean, you don't even need AI to automate a lot of things that yeah. are being automated now. Yeah. So changes are coming. And I think as a society, we need to think about those changes mm -hmm. and what, what that means. Um, but I also think that this is, this is something like we've thought about a lot at Kindred, and it's why we are specifically pursuing the goal of human-like intelligence rather than just saying we're pursuing AGI or general purpose intelligence. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's like a bit subtle, but I think there's a really key difference here. Yeah. So if you build an AI system that is non-human-like, it's essentially very alien, it's very difficult to scrutinize what it's doing, what its goals are, and develop um, empathy what it's with it. Thinking, yeah, yeah. But the thing about human like intelligence is that we understand it intuitively very well. We know it when we see it. We have millions, billions of examples of it already. So there's a kind of a baseline of you, you know what you're making progress in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And say you were able to create a perfect mimic of human, of say average human like intelligence. The worst case scenario is you have a bad human, <laughs> right? And I think that's a much better outcome than saying having some, some AI that was, uh, I don't know, in control of the stock market or something like that, yeah, which, and you have no idea right. what it's doing. And it's a it's black thinking. box problem afterwards. Yeah. If you create human-like intelligence, you'll be able to communicate with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't communicate with intelligences that are not like your own. We can't even communicate with dolphins or chimps. Yeah. Like, how do we expect to communicate with these AIs if they have completely different concepts and thought patterns? And if it's embodied and localized, it would be much easier to control, to communicate yeah. with, to yeah. create empathy with, yeah. and all those yeah. things. And I think human-like AI people will feel empathy towards it, as long as you don't create uncanny valley situations. Yeah. People do. You know, they anthropomorphize things they fall in love with characters from movies like wally -E or johnny five yeah. like if you create it right i think people won't be afraid of these things i think they'll actually embrace them mm -hmm. let me ask you about this uh, you say that your company's central thesis is that intelligence requires a body so we we already um discover uh, discussed a little bit about that but Perhaps you can share with us how, in reality, do you give a robot a body? And, and you right. mentioned, of course, the, the, the sensor-like uh, experiences that we have with our own vision, touch, audio, etc. Tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about that. Yes. Giving a robot a body. Yes. <laughs> so, again, I know we touched on this, but what the, the reason why we're doing this is really, really important. So it's not just, I want to build humanoid robots. It's like, no, not where I wanted to come, come out with this. The, the reason we're doing it is because I don't believe an intelligence you develop that's not in a human-like body will be human-like in any way. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it'll think like a human. It won't yeah. have the, the same uh, understanding of the world. Yeah. And you won't be able to communicate with it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, even people with different cultures that are still human, we have difficulty communicating with. So it has to be very, very close. So, yes, physically, how do we do this? Well, I, I take what's sort of called a tall pole approach. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you try and you first try and mimic the things that are the easiest and the most important. To the low hanging right. fruit. Yeah. yeah. So things like vision is a good example because there's been a lot of um, a lot of money and progress made in creating like small cameras that are yeah. very good. They you may argue that they're not still not as good as the human eye in terms of like a focal ability and yeah. our uh, convergence ability and things, but they are there. They're very good and they're very cheap. Yeah. So you can use a, an off-the-shelf webcam to yeah. make a very state-of-the-art robot vision system, for example. In so, fact, one of your sample robots that I was looking at before yes. the interview has the exact same webcam yeah. that I'm using to yep. record my own <laughs> interviews. Yeah, so webcams are actually probably like the best thing you can get like now. And they, For $80 they're good enough. or they're something. Good enough, yeah. yeah. Um, audio systems too, you can get really good quality binaural microphones, which we're using on all of our robots. Um, 
then so those are the kind of two easy and big ones so then the next one is obviously movement like you can't have a human-like intelligence without it having some form of human-like body and limbs that can move so um we go with they're off the shelf but they're fairly advanced like hobby servos for most of the robots mm -hmm. the reason we go with the hobby ones is just the size like industrial servos start to get too big for the Very sizes heavy. of robots yeah. we're looking at. So although I'm mostly talking about the, the robots that I work with, there's other people in the company that are building much bigger ones too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so, so servos. Now servos aren't really very good. They're not a very good um, analog to the way the human body works because we're much more, you know, we have muscles. Much and more they, dexterous. Yeah, the, the muscles work in a very different way to a servo, which like directly changes the angle of a joint, whereas a muscle like pulls and indirectly changes things. So we're investigating like more bio-inspired ways to mm -hmm. move bodies but that is that field is a little bit behind some of the other things like vision and audio haptics it's a sense of touch is even worse <laughs> yeah that's very hard to yeah. do properly and if you think about it the sense of touch is probably the the most ignored but most critical sense we have if right. you look at, at how we evolve from like tiny single-celled organisms they evolved cilia and, and hairs that could feel things way before they evolved say vision and it's crucial for baby proper baby development yeah. right after yeah. being born you know that kind of touch is mm. very important psychologically and otherwise yeah. for the the first input or feedback mm -hmm. that the baby gets from the outside world because yeah. they don't see or hear very well they're kind of that's their primary sense for the first few days or weeks mm -hmm. i think yeah, building, um, so if you're trying to build a model of both yourself and your environment, touch is critical. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't even know where the outline of your body ends and the yeah. environment begins, then you can't build a good self model, which is what our AIs try to do. So touch is very important. We've been looking into that sense a lot. And then there are other things that aren't quite so important, we believe, but we want to put in eventually things like the sense of smell. Um, taste and then other parts of the body like you know mimicking hormones and this mm -hmm. kind of thing Th those are I don't think they're as as, as important at the moment because we're, we're getting pretty far with with what we have but they will become important at some point what about consciousness does mm -hmm. that is that necessary at all I think it's necessary but I also think it's an emergent property so oh really yes. that's very interesting yeah. so i'm of the school of thought that if you build a brain-like system that mm -hmm. has the the right structure and is connected to uh, an embodied set of senses and actuators in the right way mm -hmm. consciousness will emerge if you get enough of the um enough complexity in the model that that organism has of itself or primarily. maybe daniel dennett is correct in saying that consciousness is an illusion that Yep. It, it does yeah. emerge indeed, but it doesn't as a perception mm. or a self-delusion, if you will, but it doesn't really exist. Yes, I, 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 I do tend to agree with that, with that school yeah. of thought. It's the things that we think of as the properties of consciousness, I think, will emerge from any sufficiently advanced model mm -hmm. that's able to contemplate its own mm -hmm. existence as an embodied agent. Right. I don't think you need anything more than that, anything magical. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me a little bit more details about your company. How many people do you have? Where are you located? And things like that. We, we, we still, yeah, let's start with yeah. those. So we currently have three offices. The company was originally founded in Vancouver, which mm -hmm. is where I'm based now. Um, but we have three offices, one in Vancouver, one in San Francisco, and one in Toronto. Mm -hmm. Yep, there's about 35 people working for the company wow. at the moment. And we're about two and a half, two and three quarters years old. Now. Okay. Yeah. And uh, what about funding? Did you get uh, angel investors or seed capital? How did that work in the yeah, beginning? Yeah, we raised uh, we raised a seed round from mm -hmm. uh, local investors in the network, and then later on we raised a Series A mm -hmm. um, round from some more big name investors. There was quite a few of the um, big Silicon Valley investors in that in that round. Give us some examples, perhaps. Um, so in the the seed, the two large ones were data collective and first round mm -hmm. and then in the series a we had um google ventures and eclipse join mm -hmm. us mm -hmm. um, so, yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay and uh 
what about the people you said you have 35 people mm -hmm. share with us a few notable names yeah. uh, i know uh jordi rose is now the chief executive officer yeah that's right yeah so um jordi um is working for kindred now he's uh he's left e wave you and, stole him well <laughs> <laughs> yeah so he i mean he's been interested in ai for almost as long as i have maybe yeah maybe longer which is why his parting message even though the topic yeah. of our conversation was quantum computers his message was machine learning or uh, is closer than you think yeah. or artificial intelligence is closer yeah. than, than you think yeah now that it, and, it all makes sense and he'd been he, he's he's been thinking about AI for a long time and also kind of a similar route thinking about it in terms of quantum computers but then just becoming interested in it as a as an entity in itself and um, I, I was in conversations with him for a long time about how you might structure this as a company yeah. or that kind yeah. of thing and yeah. I basically um, rang him up and said would you like to join kindred <laughs> full time wow. and he said yes so that was that was excellent phenomenal yeah and yeah we, we wouldn't have been able to do any of the fundraising or like that without him it's been it's been really he, good. Jordi is very knowledgeable and experienced yeah. in yeah. that field so yeah. but what about the actual development team because mm -hmm. you guys are i don't know now let me uh, pull back a little bit so are you now on the sort of the administrative slash leadership position or are you at the development end of things or, or where, where about do you fit now among those 35 yeah. people so I'm my you're title founder, is CTO, your chief technology yeah, officer. Yeah. but I do, I do lots of things so um, I see my role as primarily to keep the company on mission in the long term mm -hmm. so looking at the technologies that are being developed within the company whether they be for research or for product mm -hmm. and just making sure that there's that path is still always there um, yeah. but I mean day to day I still do a lot of stuff in the lab the team mm -hmm. we have in Vancouver is small so I'm often found building robot or doing some soldering or something like that awesome. so very hands-on I like to try and understand the technologies that my teams are developing at a very deep level mm -hmm. so I want to always be involved at least in some part in the the sort of coal face mm -hmm. uh, details mm -hmm. of that kind of stuff yeah. so tell us some of the the names that you can share with us from the team members mm -hmm. in in the key positions that do the robotics yeah. or the part of putting the creating the actual mind mm -hmm. into the robot yeah so our chief science officer is james bergstra and he was actually one of the lead developers on theano which is a library that was used to speed up a lot of machine learning things um, there are there are other libraries like that now that have become available, but that was the first, and a lot of people still use it and think it's the best. So mm -hmm. we were really um, ecstatic when he decided to join us. Um, having that experience was was awesome. And uh, James also thinks a lot about um, ro like robotic life and what it means. Uh, he's very interested in things like animal intelligence and how that's different from human intelligence or is it at all and that kind of thing. So he he's, he's also very, thinks very deeply about some of these uh, issues in AI. Um, there's um, George Babu, who he's in charge of our product development and he's actually developed products before so this was a this was a very good um find for our founding team because we were a bunch of techies <laughs> and <laughs> um as you probably know techies don't tend to think a lot about products yeah. so finding some people who are obsessed with products and really want to bring stuff forward and get this the into practical the let's make yeah. it all yeah. practical the practical yeah. i yeah. suffer from that failure myself tremendously <laughs> but anyway yeah but no it's great to have it's great to have people on the team that just live and breathe um, that world so that's mm -hmm. great mm -hmm. and we also have um, Graham Taylor who um, is one of the world's leading machine learning experts on time series data he's at the University of Guelph now and he's one, he's one of our advisors now Wow. Um, and also Ajay Agarwal is a part-time advisory role and he's a professor of economics at U of T. Mm -hmm. So, and, and having, we have a very diverse founding group, yeah. which we felt was important for a company like this. Yes. Because if you're creating something like intelligence <laughs> as a product, it's going to impact everything. everything. Yes. It's going to impact society. It's going to impact science. It's going to impact technology. It's going to impact economics, politics. So we wanted a very diverse um, background of people and having an economist 
on board was excellent because we had start asking questions straight away of how does this affect the future of the economy and things like that. What about ethics? Does it have space somewhere there? Yeah, I'm very excited about ethics <laughs> personally uh, and in a way that's a little unusual. So when most people think about ethics, they think how will robots impact humans and, you know, is it ethical to um, uh, I don't know, do something to a human or have a human uh, experience something. But I'm also interested in robot ethics. Mm -hmm. Like, how are we going to treat the, these things that we are creating? Like robot building? artificial intelligence rights. Yes. Instead yeah. of uh, uh, human rights, mm -hmm. so intelligence hum human rights. Human rights are very important. Sure, and sure. And we've, we've been fighting over the years yes. to, to include more and more of yes. humanity and civilization yes. into that human rights bracket. And now what I see is going to happen is, you know, when we create these sort of new machine sentiences, mm -hmm. which, by the way, are already here, they're just not human-like yet. Mm -hmm. They're sort of at the level of, you know, ants or maybe kind of insect, that sort of level, but mm -hmm. they'll, they'll get there quickly because mm -hmm. it's going to exponentially um, improve. And uh, we should be thinking about this now. Like yes. if you had, so a thought experiment, if you had a humanoid robot that passed the Turing test and for all intents and purposes was behaving like a human and you couldn't tell the difference other than the way it looked, would that be like how would we treat that could you keep him meaning? as a slave at home to yes. do all your could bidding could that could that robot gain citizenship mm. like do you, you need know. to pay your robot to do your yeah. laundry yeah would 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 robots be considered as slaves i wouldn't be happy with that situation but i think a lot of people think that is what they will be mm -hmm. um i i've done a lot of sort of market research amongst people and mm -hmm. The, the, the thing that I get more than anything else is I want a robot to clean my home and yeah, do my dirty do my chores. dishes and laundry uh, and yeah. all that stuff. And that's great, but I don't know if you should have a human-like AI enabled right. robot and, for that. <laughs> and I, I, I hear people say, well, we don't need them to be at human intelligence, yeah. perhaps, if it's for the laundry and for the dishwasher. And we already do have stupid robots like called dishwashers yeah. and laundry machines yeah. who do yeah. that for us anyway. So maybe we just need them to be a little bit smarter so that they can even put it in the drawer or something and iron it and do the whole thing. But they don't need to be human intelligence and then we don't have to feel bad about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's the usual, the <laughs> usual way to avoid that. But um, tell me a little bit something about the name Kindred because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I think that goes to the core of what you're talking about, about that mutual, peaceful yes. cohabitation yeah. and in existence. Yeah. So it, the name is very interesting because it has, it has several different meanings and several Absolutely. different Absolutely, it's multi-layered. Yeah, things uh, with it. So the, the main kind of primary meaning of the word is in the sense of the kindred spirit. Mm -hmm. So we want the things that we're developing and will eventually have living amongst us to feel like our, like our teammates or our, um, you know, our uh, other, other beings in our Our best friends, perhaps. Yeah, our companions. Um, we yes. want them to feel like family, like friends, like um, part, of, part of civilization. So that's where the kindred came from. It's this idea of sitting around the campfire mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. your tribe is like a set of kindred spirits. But then there's also a couple of other connotations. Like there's a, there's a little bit of a, a vampire reference you'll find if you look <laughs> up the word kindred. And that's kind of interesting because... To me, that symbolizes um, what we were talking about before with the not everything is a utopia. I mean, there will be problems and issues mm -hmm. arising, and I don't think we should pretend that that's not going to happen. I think we should acknowledge it and start thinking of, of ways in which we can get around it. So this slightly dark undertone of the word. Perhaps the is, angel and demon topic that we were seeing yes, in your art before <laughs> emerging in a different form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think that's... That's just a little nod to that, yet yeah, we're aware that, you know, there, there could be issues, there will be societal upheaval, there will be things... And maybe it's unclear wrong. which ones are the angels and which ones are the demons, mm -hmm. and as you said, there's something good in each and something yeah. bad in each, and yeah. Yeah. we're a bit of both, perhaps, or, or who is going to turn out to be what is to be seen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... Um, What's the kind of the goals or the benchmarks that you kind of uh, 
Well, let me backtrack a little bit before that question. And let me ask you this. So you've been in stealth mode for two and a half years. You're going public now. This is mm -hmm. among the first interviews that yep. you've ever done. Why now? <laughs> Um, well, we believe now that the technology is at a place where we've kind of shown that the underlying ideas all work. Because it could have just been that something wasn't ready, like I was talking about three technology yeah. uh, things earlier. It could have just been that networks just weren't fast enough to do any mm -hmm. of this kind of stuff. But So we believe we've, we've proven out that all these technologies are now robust and solid enough to, to build something a layer on top of them to put them and, together yeah and we've also built and demonstrated that the whole system works from end to end which is i i like building things and then showing them rather than just telling people mm -hmm. what we're going to build so i didn't want to show people any of the stuff that we've created at kindred until it's ready until it's at least you know at a stage where where people will be you know less skeptical so when it. can we see it uh, well, over the next few months, we're going to be increasingly showing more and more of our stuff. I mm -hmm. think our website will be going live this week, so people mm -hmm. will be able to go there and there'll be, there'll be things added to that uh, over time. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so can you tell us perhaps something about the, the products that you would be showing and releasing? Mm -hmm. So the, the company, the purpose of Kindred is to become a profitable business. <laughs> so obviously, if you want to become a profitable business, you need to create and sell products. Um, the kind of products that we're looking at are AI enabled. Um, they're going to be combinations of AIs working together with humans. Mm -hmm. So I can't talk about any of the products in detail, but I can give you an overview of, of the general class okay. in which these products are in. Okay. So uh, I already mentioned about the teleoperation systems. Yes. So imagine that you have um, a robot that's in an, in an existing um, category of industry and its job is to do something like move objects like back around right? something like that okay yeah so the problem with those kind of robots is they're usually pre-programmed just to move something from a to b and all the numbers are programmed in but there'll be edge cases where say something falls over or from the edge of the shelf on the ground yeah, yeah. or there's a pack it's, it has to move packets of something and one of the packets is split open and the contents is spilling out so in that case the robot doesn't know what to do or it thinks it knows what to do it'll just grab and then it'll make a mess or yeah, you know yeah. screw something up um, so those edge cases are where a human has to come in, manually stop that robot, fix the situation. Yeah. What we want to do is have um, the AI look out for anomalous situations that it can't out handle of pattern. itself. Yeah. And then it can call for a human to come for in help. and help. Yeah. yeah. And a human can take direct control of that robot within mm -hmm. a couple of seconds. Mm -hmm. They can manipulate it using With the our telepresence, interface. remote yeah. connection thing. Fix the problem yeah. and then let the robot carry on. And then on. put on yeah. auto mode again. And there yeah. are many, many examples uh, of, of just even these edge cases, but also there are industries where things haven't been able to be automated because this, these are not just edge cases. This kind of thing happens It's like a lot. the pattern. The pattern yeah. is there is very yeah. hard pattern to discern yeah. in the first place. Yeah. And in those cases, we yeah. can take pre-existing robots, put them in there, and now you have this, this hybrid yeah. control system. So you can now start to, mm -hmm. start to put robots into tasks that haven't been able to be um, have robots doing them before. So, mm -hmm. so that's the kind of uh, product that we're, we're going after at the moment. Mm -hmm. Some people would say, well, if your purpose is to be a profitable corporation, that's very different from the purpose of uh, maybe creating uh, free robots mm -hmm. as their thinking agents, because wouldn't you kind of, and, and you're someone very concerned about robots or intelligence, right? So let's say you're successful. You create a million self-thinking robots. Mm -hmm. The purpose of Kindred AI is to be a profitable company, but someone either rebels from those robots or there's a movement to mm -hmm. uh, give them personhood and, yep. and, and intelligence rights. And then what used to be your property mm -hmm. become free agents now. So is there no tension there? I think there is tension, but I think there are also clever solutions to this okay. problem. Um, so, uh, one thing I should mention at first is not everything we build will be sort of fully human-like. Yes. The kind of tasks I was talking about, yeah. although they're hard to automate now, you can build 
special purpose AIs that do handle those edge cases. It's just that people have never had the training data and the ability to train mm -hmm. those things. So mm -hmm. you could create um, an object, that, uh, sorry, a robot that picks up objects, even if it's an unusual situation, you can train a sort of smart AI to do yeah. that. But that yeah. won't be a fully human-like, fully fledged, you know, walking, talking sentience. Yeah. Um, so those kind of things, maybe it's a little bit of a gray area, but I don't know if those things would necessarily mm -hmm. have to be granted full rights. Mm -hmm. um, but in the case you're talking about, I think it's really interesting. And one way you could think about this is if you can create workers that are human-like and uh, even if they don't have rights, it's obvious that they should have rights. What I believe is that you could look at interesting business models where those robots become your employees and you're actually... What if they decide to go on a trip around the world? Well, I think that's, <laughs> I think that's okay. <laughs> I mean, but all, all, uh, all entities need to somehow survive and they will need things. Mm -hmm. So um, they will need resources like energy and, I mm -hmm. don't know, oil. <laughs> Whatever is their favorite beverage of... Charging uh, <laughs> lithium batteries and stuff. Yeah. yeah, that kind of thing. So the question is, where do they get those from? Mm -hmm. um, so they have to integrate into our society somehow because there are physical resources that they need. Mm -hmm. So if at that point the economy is similar to how it is now, that means they will have to be paid a wage for something they give in return and they will then use that wage to gather those resources. Mm -hmm. So that's one way I could Option, see it going. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, even so, I hate to talk about slaves, but even if it ended up being like that, even slaves were sometimes given some like purchasing power from their masters and that kind of thing. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I really don't want them to end up like that, though. I'd want them mm -hmm. to sort of have full, have mm -hmm. full rights and full citizenship. Um, but then, of course, there's the even more extreme scenario of the economy as we know it may not even exist. Yeah. when this happens because i think that's the more likely scenario yeah. in my view actually i think like some of the ideas robin hansen has of what's going to happen to the economy when you have copyable capital the m yes economy, yeah. the the m scenario now with physical systems it's not as bad because you still have to create the physical yeah. embodiment but copying the brain is just as easy once you right. have done that so you could create, if you, if you create... You don't even, have scarcity anymore. Yeah, there's not scarcity, only in the sense of how many of these can I make, you know, in a week. Mm -hmm. But the question then is, are they going to be smart enough in the sense that, let's say you have a thousand copies of me. That means, or you, or, or even someone brilliant like Albert Einstein. It doesn't mean you're a thousand times smarter than Einstein. It only means you have a thousand people who are as dumb as Einstein. And each of them is very smart, mind mm -hmm. you, but they're not a thousand times more useful. One Einstein is probably yeah. sufficient to do the job of an Einstein. And then the other ones are obviously not going to be cleaners and firemen because Einstein mm -hmm. was not good for that. Mm -hmm. So how is that like isn't diversity especially intellectual diversity yep. very important and how do you resolve that process yeah i think it will it will be similar to the scenario we have now there will be lots of different minds and lots of different body types mm -hmm. um, they'll you know people will start by building these and want to explore the diversity of robots but then eventually the robots will start deciding themselves mm -hmm. like you know well wouldn't it be great if i had this upgrade or different mm -hmm. brain but yeah i think it will it will be a very diverse ecosystem mm -hmm. um i very much doubt there would be 10,000 copies of one person uh for example and, and another thing is because of how the the neural the neural net based ais we develop are architected it's possible to kind of take part of one and sort of cross modular sort of yeah, plug and yeah, play or yeah. intro so you can't do this in any way you might imagine yeah. but there are certain ways you could do it so you could imagine um almost a, a genetic algorithm yes. type of meta thing going on on top of this which wow is, that's fascinating we'll yeah. come back to that for a sec in a second but let me ask you first about the goals and benchmarks and the timeline so how do you see Kindred AI in five years and ten years, where, where do you see yourself? Right, that's a hard question. <laughs> well, we're a futurist uh, show, we interview the future, so yeah, yeah. five and ten years is what we yeah. do at least. <laughs> so, yeah, I think in the near term, I think that the uh, technology will continue progressing 
and we will be able to create very high fidelity um, humanoid robots that mm -hmm. are able to do a wide range of tasks. Mm -hmm. So I don't think by on that time frame we'll be at full general purpose AI, but I think we'll start seeing these systems that are excellent at sort of modular tasks that require some generality mm -hmm. or some ability to generalize around that task. Mm -hmm. So we'll start seeing uh, more and more AI going out there into the into the workforce and you know into industry, even though it's not fully general yet. Um, I also think this human AI hybridization of uh, humans helping AIs learn and then AIs helping humans by not having them do the boring bits of their mm -hmm. job, I think that's going to be a big deal. Mm -hmm. And I don't see it as people's jobs being taken. I see it as those people being made more productive because now um, an AI can do the parts of the human job that are very repetitive and tedious and that human is now freed up to help more of the AIs. So what they're actually doing is doing a more interesting job, maybe even remotely. So they're not in a, a, you know, a nasty kind of environment anymore, which a lot of these jobs are very um, But what if strenuous. all jobs turn out to be repetitive at one level or another? So we see that yeah. happening already yeah. even with high level jobs like radiologists for example mm -hmm. or oncologists Watson is going to replace probably both of them and even jobs like lawyers mm -hmm. and 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 high-level accountants and or whole accounting divisions now are being replaced by smart accounting software and stuff so is that not saying that I mean that's another way of asking is what's your take on technological unemployment is yep. that something yep. That we should be concerned about because it would appear to me that your robots will be so very capable that almost nothing provided you're successful mm -hmm. in theory nothing should be impossible if they're at human level intelligence yeah I, I think that's true that's it's gonna be a way out <laughs> so mm -hmm. um, yeah what, what do you mean by way out by the way just like I think 10, this, 20, 30? the scenario you're talking about is probably a couple of decades away. Okay. Because even so, even if tomorrow we manage to build this this um, general purpose thing, to get that out there in the world and distribute it and the uptake, all these other kind of systems are slow. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about the technological innovations and breakthroughs. It's about having them actually um, in the real world yeah actually yeah. like percolate through so mm -hmm. for example we've had vr headsets now for like 40 years or something yes, right? since the 80s, <laughs> and yeah. only only just they're only just becoming available as consumer devices right, right. so i mean i think i think like a general purpose ai might be faster because there's a, there's an obvious uh, demand mm -hmm. for it but i still think it'll be it'll take a long time even if the tech um, progresses really really quickly mm -hmm. but I do think technological unemployment is going to be a big problem and we have to do something about it um, we have to start thinking about this scenario now yeah. uh, and I think governments need to start thinking about what's going to happen mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. because the, the problem is is if you replace if you replace all labor and and no one has a wage anymore there's no consumer base so mm -hmm. the whole of the economy fails and capitalism doesn't make sense anymore so mm -hmm. <laughs> there has to be something um, right. that comes after that let me ask you this what's the competitive advantage that your company brings to the market that didn't exist before mm -hmm. what's that kind of unique element in your recipe of ai because let's be honest there is hundreds i mean ai is the most is the fad right now mm -hmm. everywhere everything is ai fight yep. Um, so what's unique about Kindred AI? Our core um, our uniquenesses are the human-like aspect of it and the ability to um, train those systems and have the AIs and the humans work together mm -hmm. um, in real time. So this is not just humans are supplying training data and then AIs are being trained on it. Mm -hmm. It's like a human and an AI are both sitting at the controls and then there's a system that decides who should be in control at any one time. Very so interesting. that is something that um, there's not a lot of that kind of thing. Uh, I haven't heard of it before yeah. to be honest. Yeah. So you could imagine just Which the... doesn't mean anything other than I haven't heard of it but <laughs> it's not a measure of anything. Yeah. But it just helps like it helps uh, make everything more fluid because mm -hmm. now humans can can do tasks from anywhere. They mm -hmm. don't have to physically be in the location to perform a task. So someone... Within someone some in limitations, though. Could be. 
because yeah absolutely you're you're dead on like mm -hmm. in the philippines or here but you know taking that a few steps further if we talk about elon musk's uh, goal to to go to mars and mm -hmm. stuff like that there's about a seven minute delay even to the moon which is why all those rovers the mars rovers are uh, autonomous yeah. vehicles because of the delay seven minutes or whatever it is i forget uh, it makes it impossible for them to be remote operated mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right so yeah well, that's not so much of a problem, depending on how you do the automation mm -hmm. algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, for example, at first, when the AI knows nothing, the human has to do everything. Right. Right down to the very lowest level of motor control. So they have to be moving the, the Oh, I things. see. But in time, it shifts time, to the machine it can, itself. You can automate those things. And right. the human... The human input moves up a level of abstraction. So right. now instead of moving a hand and grasping something, you just you just point and click on it and the robot will know how to right. grasp it. And then even higher up, when that part's been automated, the human will be able to say, pick up all the red objects in this room. And right. then it will already have learned all the parts it needs. And then, you know, mm -hmm. at an even higher level of abstraction, it might, you know, ask, why am I doing that? Right. And there might be something like, you know, we need to clean because, mm -hmm. you know, we have a visitor. <laughs> and yeah. you, You'll, so you'll be able to give instructions at, at higher and higher levels of abstraction mm -hmm. as the AI learns more and more, which is why the humans won't disappear anytime soon, because mm -hmm. there are many, many different levels of abstraction mm -hmm. that, that we have to issue commands at. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Very interesting. So how do you build a mind? <laughs> Simple question. <laughs> <laughs> was that was that Kurzweil's or Chris Elliott Smith's? <laughs> yeah, the, the book. <laughs> one is I always confuse yeah, them because one is how to build a mind and the <laughs> other is how to build a brain. So I always it's like there's yeah. another book about cyber uh, cyborg citizen and another book called Citizen Cyborg, and right. one is Chris Cable's Gray <laughs> and the other is James Hughes, and I always confuse yeah. who's got who's. so many. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, we were joking that we should we should write a book and call it like some obscure combination of all these things. You know? <laughs> so how do you do it? Forget yeah. the title. How do we do it in reality? Because yeah. that's not a prosaic. Task. No, it's not. It's not easy. Um, and it's not even you don't even start by thinking about how to build a mind in, in the kind of kindred way of doing things. So our, our hypothesis is that intelligence needs a body specifically mm -hmm. human-like intelligence needs a human-like body mm -hmm. so the first thing we believe you need to do is build a body and that body has to have analogous sensors and actuators. all the sensory input yeah to whatever kind of mind you want to build mm -hmm. um, and then the the next and the important thing about that is all that data has to be able to stream in real time right so it has and be to, processed right yeah. so it has to get there and be processed and be acted upon yeah, yeah. and yeah, yeah. Full, full feedback loop yeah. yeah, and, and okay. it all has to happen in a time scale that is shorter than how our own brain. Like milliseconds, yeah. we're talking. Yeah, yeah. So we have we have systems that. So the first thing we built was robots, and the second thing we built was a um, like a nervous system that mm -hmm. allowed those uh, perception signals to flow in, processing to happen, and action signals to Outputs. flow out yeah. within um, a time frame that mm -hmm. was reasonable. You know, reasonable compared yeah. to humans. So, for example, on the, uh, a very detailed example is on the video you have to be able to do things at like 30 frames per second because that's like the minimum right. uh, viable, uh, you know, like the frame rate that you mm -hmm. can get from a Refresh webcam rate. that's actually yeah. useful for it. Um, the, the motor side is even harder because things like balance require very fast um, mm -hmm. micro movements and things like that. So it's a hard problem, but you have to solve that problem. So yeah. we've, we've solved that problem now. And then the, there's like... In, again, this is like the way we do it at Kindred. I'm not saying it's the only way to do it, but we also consider um, the physiology of the robot to be critical. So um, a lot of people define intelligence as being able to achieve goals mm -hmm. in a wide range of environments. Mm -hmm. We agree with that, but with the caveat that the agent itself also has to be able to survive. Because by definition, if the agent can't survive, it can't achieve the goal. So even though some people interpret this badly as being, oh, the agent is going to want to have its survival over mm -hmm. everything else. Self-preservation. I just think that, that is unavoidable because if, if you don't, then you lose that, that sense of it being able to be an agent in the first place. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's a bit of an aside. So you think that the self-preservation <laughs> yes, is a must? Yes, I think so. I think you have to give um, embodied AI goals, and I think one of them has to be self-preservation or survival. What if it becomes in conflict, like 
with the human life or in, in danger? I mean, in other words, do you need to have something akin to Asimov's first law of robotics that, you know, it should not uh, endanger mm -hmm. or through inactivity allow a human life to be endangered? Yeah, I mean, that is a conflict. So you're trying to build another exactly. entity that is like you. So by definition, it's going to have those values like I protect myself mm -hmm. first and foremost. I just don't think you can build human-like intelligence without having some of those human-like values which sometimes come into conflict. So, but the, one of the ways we, we're preventing um, or maintaining the safety of these systems early on is keeping them small. Mm -hmm. So like physically small and also like not as capable as mm -hmm. they could be. Mm -hmm. This kind of sounds silly, but if you start messing around with like wild like neural a nets in a, in a robot. giant robot, yeah. it's going to like yeah. smack you in the face, <laughs> right? I've actually had my robot smack me in the face more than once. But luckily, they're small enough that they don't do too much damage. Wow. Yeah. So you realize when you start building things, you realize very quickly, like, there are things that you have to put into the robot before you even get to the AI part that are super important. Um, so, so, so how big is your robot that smacked um, you in the face? The, <laughs> the one that smacked me in the face. It was about two and a half feet tall. Um, yeah, and I was just, I think I was just, like, messing with some of it, like, its electronics or something, and it... Wow, don't do that. <laughs> Leave me alone. Yeah, so okay. that's fun. Did you, um, what was your reaction in a situation like that? Did you think like, oh, it's my fault? Or did you have like the first reaction is like, whoa. Like, well, tell me something about that occurrence. Well, kind of, my first reaction was to sort of jump backwards. But my second reaction was actually like, that was pretty funny. <laughs> because like, you know, the little robot just like hit me. Smacked you. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's obviously not funny when they get to be uh, Exactly, larger. if it's a three-ton yeah. super robot. Yeah. But this is exactly the reason mm -hmm. why we are starting with smaller, for, for the research stuff anyway, mm -hmm. um, starting with smaller robots. That's, yeah. that's totally fascinating. So um, let me um, talk a little bit about goals and the importance of that, because you already talked about the importance of self-preservation, yeah. mm -hmm. and we touched a tiny little bit about the dangers of that, because... You know, humans definitely, we do have self-preservation, otherwise we wouldn't survive, but yet it's a fine balance between entire selfishness and, and uh, you know, you can become a psychopath if you're totally mm -hmm. disregarding other people's concerns and pain and issues. Uh, and so it's a fine balancing act. So first of all, let's go back to that maybe. How do you balance that mm -hmm. between selfishness and sort of not being too selfish? Yeah. I think again, it comes back to this idea size, of the, okay. yeah, well, not just size, but the developments, um, mm -hmm. kind of uh, the snapshot of where it is. Oh, the the gradual learning process. Yeah. So I if you it. think about if you think about human children or human mm -hmm. babies, they're entirely selfish through experience, right? right? They they will they will cry and they will work you to exhaustion in order to get their goal. But we don't find that. Well, I find that kind of terrifying, but <laughs> many people don't find that terrifying because you know that it's it's exhausting but it's not going to kill you and you know you have mm -hmm. to look after um the, the next generation things like this so if you if you have something that's very 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 selfish i think it but it's also small and immature i think you can kind of like accept that or so through education and a yeah, proper upbringing yes. in time yeah. i think you it, can kind of change that yeah. behavior because by definition when you're working with the kind of ai models we're working with they they don't have concepts like empathy or a exactly. sense of even a sense of self a sense of other right until you're really far along in building the brain the right. first things that that develop in the brain are things like um you know object recognition right things like um invariance like if i look over there the object's not going to suddenly disappear it's going to stay there um things like face recognition yeah. things like you know moving your hand hand-eye coordination all these things come before mm -hmm. you get to those more what we think of as human mm -hmm. values. So mm -hmm. I believe if you're trying to build a human-like intelligence, it has to go through this sort of childlike phase. Right, childhood. Where, yeah, where it's learning all the basics that it's then right. going to use to develop those more complex value systems. Right. And I think the way that you deal with that is you, make, you keep the robot physically small and you, you treat it as a child. You, you're like, this is, it's like a child robot. It's going to do these things. I think Hans Morovic called them our mind children. Yeah. 
Yeah. So yeah, yeah, that that's a great point, and it's basically the same process as bringing up a child into the world mm -hmm. takes mm -hmm. years, and we are right now in very early stages of of development. So let's talk a little bit about the importance of goals because you you say here, and I'm quoting from your uh, I think mm -hmm. press release. Kintrit is developing minds for robots, software that provides machines with goals and the means to learn and better achieve, achieve them. So how can you give goals to yeah. robots? Because <laughs> part of the goals may be self-preservation, but another part is, is what? Pleasure and pain. Mm -hmm. So how do you give pleasure yeah. and pain to a robot? Mm -hmm. Well, there's, okay, there's two, there's two parts to this. So the first way that we tackled this at Kindred was we believed that we can effectively sideload all goals and, and values and other things from humans themselves. So if you, if you teleoperate a robot and it's doing exactly what you do, then the, the hope was that it will start to, over time, inherit your value system because everything it's doing in the world will have come from a human value system deciding what that goal should be. So every time a robot picks up an object, that robot is, um, it's, it's not explicitly aware, but it's implicitly aware that doing that is a good thing or something a human would do. And you can use techniques such as inverse reinforcement learning to have the goal inferred mm -hmm. from the training data mm -hmm. that you're showing the robot. Mm -hmm. So our original plan was to show the robots, you know, thousands or millions of training examples of things that humans yeah. do. Yeah. And as a byproduct, they start to do things in a human-like way. So you've kind of, you haven't told them explicitly what the goal is, but right. you've sort of like kind of, I like this idea of sideloading, which is I think a Greg Egan story mm -hmm. um, talks Indeed. about that a lot. But I really like this idea. However, the problem with that is it takes a very long time. And the, the hardest goals, uh, the, the goals that are the most important are the hardest ones to, to sideload in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, we're now coming up with a system where you can also the robot has its own goal system built in and that's based around its survival as an entity. Mm -hmm. And the way uh, we do that is exactly what you said. We have analogs of pleasure and pain. We have um, a, we call, what we call a physiology engine, which takes raw data from the robot's body and it tells the brain whether that data is good or bad. Mm -hmm. Now a human has had to make that decision. Yeah, hot, cold, yes. and burning like myself. If, you're, if or... your motor is twisting backwards like yeah. this, that's pain, you know. Yeah. And what it, what it will try and do is um, not do those movements in future that resulted in that pain. Yeah. So this is a more direct way of putting values into a robot, but mm -hmm. you are then basing them around the, the self-preservation. Self so it's a selfish. Yeah. Yeah. Let me talk to you about the first principle because it goes to the heart of what I call the magnifying mirror of technology, which is the reflection mm -hmm. problem. In other words, the danger is that that robot may be a mirror image of us, which may or may not be a good thing. And a good example of that occurrence was the Microsoft robot that mm -hmm. shortly became a xenophobic, sexist, Nazi, yep. white supremacist <laughs> robot. So how do we avoid that problem? Mm -hmm. Because there are people who are all of yeah. those things, and as I said, this is what I call the magnifying mirror problem, because technology is a reflection of who we are, and if we're not careful, we may magnify the things that we don't like and minimize the things mm -hmm. that we like, so we'd better be very specific and careful. Yeah. How do we avoid, how do we solve that? Well, that's a very difficult problem. I it mean, is. even... So, so you have this, this ability to put, put, put values into a robot, whether by designing them in or by sideloading them in from some human. But then you might ask, well, is that human the right one to be taking that training data from? There are many other humans in the world, some of which have very different cultures and very different like, thought processes to, to say, I don't know, anyone at Kindred. So who's to say we're right and they're wrong? Mm -hmm. um, so my, my take on this is that I think the whole process should be somewhat democratic. Because I think if, you've, if you focus and concentrate power and only tr and try and make like the best thing mm -hmm. that's unique, it always ends up backfiring. And mm -hmm. so what I think we need to do is get lots of robots out there into the sort of cultural um, melange that we have 
and allow our culture to influence them. So if you think about any one human, maybe really bad, but on a whole, I don't think we're <laughs> like everyone is bad. So if you let um, the values more on mass um, filter into this robot society, then that could help. But it's a hard problem. I don't really have. Yeah, to I, I would suggest two things to be careful. Perhaps here is that on the whole, whether we're good or bad, I don't know. I mm -hmm. hope we're good, but we're doing on the whole very unsmart things at the very least. Yep. So we are destroying our own planet. We know that. Uh, and there are many other examples mm -hmm. that would show that on the whole we're not always doing the right, even the selfish thing is, we're not even doing the selfishly mm -hmm. right thing to do for our own sake. Uh, and personally what I think is what you're talking about is in a way a, a, a mentorship program. Mm -hmm. Just like for human growth yep. from children to become productive members of society as adults, mentorship and good role models are very important. And I think here mm -hmm. in that example with robots, it will be kind of the same thing, very important. And which is why I'm, I'm, li I'm liking my metaphor that technology is a magnifying mirror. Yep. Because in the end of the day, it's, it's a blank tool which reflects who we are. And if we put the, the wrong image, we're going to get uh, the yep. demon out yep. rather than the angel. <laughs> <laughs> what, one interesting thing about this that may be different with some, uh, say, machine sentences than with humans is once they've got to human level intelligence, um, presumably that also implies that they're now able to understand their own coding, to, at least to the extent we can. So those entities are now able to go in and tweak parameters to reprogram in their themselves. brains in a way that we are not or at least in a, we can do it in a very crude way they can they can do it they can increase their number of cortical modules by a thousand fold and see what that does mm -hmm. and my hope for this is that they actually in becoming super intelligent in this way they also become super empathetic and they become um, a super version of the, themselves in, in the sense of being able to model others. Mm -hmm. So I think one, one definition of intelligence is being able to build a, a rich and faithful model of the yourself and the environment and others in the environment. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if we could build these super intelligent entities, they would understand things at a much, much better level than we do. They would know exactly what the, the impact of their actions would have on every human being on the planet. Mm -hmm. Whereas we don't, we don't know that. You know, we didn't know that if we dug all the coal out of the ground and burned fossil but fuels. But now we already do. Now we do, and it's hard to stop. It doesn't because make we a difference. Have, <laughs> yeah, but maybe these um, these sentences will be able to f find answers to these problems because they'll be they'll be able to become super smart scientists right. because they have extra resources that our brains don't have. I really hope yeah. so, but it comes to the goals then, right? Because yeah. it would be yeah. an issue of whether their goals as a kind mm. are compatible with ours. Yeah. Because maybe they don't care about the environment being destroyed because they don't need it to survive mm. the way we do. Mm. I mean, we are not aware of that fact, but we do need the environment yeah. to survive in it. Yeah. A robot may not feel that way if they find an independent source of energy like nuclear fusion or something like mm. that they maybe become totally, you know, impartial or, or at best mm -hmm. even, or at worst, totally disregard the environment. So the goal setting would be of primary importance, yeah. I think. Well, I like to think now that um, one of the things I'm most proud about uh, civ civilization is that we're starting to realize, like, the suffering we inflict on the environment and on its flora I hope and so. fauna. Yeah. And so we are kind of emerging into this more empathetic yeah, I hope civilization. So. so for example, we're now aware like if we cut down trees in this area, that's going to have an impact. And you know, maybe a few hundred years ago, no one really cared. I like yeah. to think of these uh, future beings as being like hyper yeah. aware of all that. And so when people say things like, oh, they'll just wipe us out. I'm not sure that's true. I think mm -hmm. that you can see it the very beginnings of us uh, as, a, as a society now not wanting to say kill off species mm -hmm. we want to preserve them Hopefully, we want to yeah. even bring back yeah. you know species that have gone extinct because of our actions yeah. so i think if we seed these um these new beings with our value like what we think is the very best of our value system and mm -hmm. then have them 
hyperextend that, I, I just can see that they may become... I totally like, agree with that, but it's, it's interesting that we keep coming back to it in a way is that, that we have the capacity for both angels and demons in our nature. Mm -hmm. And therefore, to me, it's a question of which nature are we going to give to our mind children? Yeah. And that's why, to me, technology is a mirror. And that's why I would suggest we have to be very deliberate and very conscious and cognizant about that process mm -hmm. and about our own responsibility as mentors, as creators, as parents to those entities, because we do bear that responsibility. Mm -hmm. So speaking of responsibility, um, do you feel like you're working to bring the technological singularity closer to us? Um, it depends how you define it. <laughs> Very well. So I know there, there are many different definitions mm -hmm. of the technological singularity. One is that I believe it's the point at which um, we achieve human-like AI. In machines. Human level AI. Human yeah. level AI. Yeah. So that I guess we are obviously working towards because it's our mission. <laughs> if that's if that's the definition. Mm -hmm. um, but to to be honest, as a definition of the singularity, that to me doesn't seem it doesn't it doesn't work somehow because it's not a singularity. Yeah, I view. think it's 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 sort of a, something that would then enable a singularity. Mm -hmm. I think if you just had if you just had human like be they robots or simulations or, or virtual mm -hmm. AIs and they were just human-like, I think our society would not be that different from it is now. We'd just have a bunch more humans around. But mm -hmm. then what would, is this, if they start then, repro if they start understanding their own programming and they start then... Recursive um, self-improvement. Yeah, yeah, that would then maybe lead to a... To a, a singularity. And, and yeah, I don't, so the singularity itself, I'm not quite sure I, mm -hmm. like, believe is the wrong word, but it's... Uh, yeah, it's, it seems to be a, a point at which you can, kind of can't tell what's going to happen. Anymore. Right. We, the idea is you borrow the idea from physics where you have the phenomenon mm -hmm. of event horizon, yep. which yep. is a point or a point beyond... point of no return. Yeah, a point of no return, a point beyond yep. which we cannot see anything because no light escapes, mm -hmm. and a point mm -hmm. beyond which our ability to model the future falls apart. Yeah. Yeah. So now your point, your counterpoint is that if we just have human level AI, it's not going to be that different. It's going to be like yeah. more intelligences, but not too different. Yeah. The, uh, the idea then is, well, what if those intelligences find a way to recursively self-improve themselves mm -hmm. where the gap between us and them grows so fast, so mm -hmm. quickly that we are unable to keep up with them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think if would that, that be qualifying as a singularity? I think for you? it would. Yeah, I think it would be okay. on that on that track exactly. of exponential right. progress. Um, however, I think in that situation, if that happens, what I think is uh, every human on the planet will have to make choices. They'll have to decide how much of the sort of new world they want to be part of, or how much of mm -hmm. the old world and old styles they want to remain part of. So. I think that there will be options for everyone. So I certainly don't think everyone has to undergo some sort of Kurzweilian merger, mm -hmm. become kind of cyborgish and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. But I think if people want to, they should have the option to do that. Yeah. Likewise, if people want to, so say the super intelligences have sorted out the economy for us and like yeah. it, there is abundance and we, we don't need to work for a wage anymore. There may be people that are just happy doing their hobbies and mm -hmm. like socializing and living a different life. But, I mean, there are people like the to Amish. engage in creative who, pursuits or, or, yeah. or decide to live outside of that society yes. like the Amish yeah. do today. Actually yeah. in Ontario, we have a number of Mennonites in Amish communities that yeah. are probably in the 19th century somewhere. Mm -hmm. So I think there would be a lot of communities that are analogues to, to the Amish for, for, for this kind of, not, not necessarily technology, but for this kind of cyborgification mm -hmm. where they're like, I, I don't want any of that stuff going inside Human 1.0. Yeah. They want to stay yeah. at that level. Yeah. But yeah. they still, you know, they'll still have their iPads and their phones and things like that. And that's fine. I think the, the future um, going towards a singularity gives us more options. Mm -hmm. Because if, if you believe that there will be abundance, then that will be able to support a, a multitude of different lifestyles, more so than there are now. So I think that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And that's not even mentioning how where virtual reality might go. 
Mm -hmm. So that might give people another vast number of options for how to live their life. Mm -hmm. So I think this, when people have this idea of we're going to merge with technology and it has the sort of undertone of and everyone has to come along with it. And I don't think that's true. Mm -hmm. I think the people that are really excited by that will want to do it. And then maybe they could even continue competing with the complete the full fully ai yeah. entities and yeah. you know trying to keep up with them and getting the latest augments <laughs> and all this kind of stuff but i think there'll be people that just don't want that and uh, i think that's great yeah <laughs> I, I actually think one of the nicest features of a free society is the ability of people to say no mm -hmm. to certain things and i think it's also a sign of a mature and self-confident society because i think that societies and cultures that lack self-confidence do not allow for uh, opting out, do not allow mm -hmm. for exceptions and are very rigid in enforcing mm -hmm. their rules and laws. Mm -hmm. um, but let me ask you something that I should have asked you a little bit earlier when we were on the building minds topic. Is there space in quantum physics when it comes to building minds or is it straightforward Newt Newtonian? I thought you might ask me this question. <laughs> yeah, I should have asked you earlier. It just occurred um, to me now. So I, I believe the brain is completely classical mm -hmm. uh, in terms of its information processing content. Obviously, mm -hmm. there are things going on in there that are quantum processes, but these are going on at a level lower than we need to go into mm -hmm. um, to get the detail of the actual like information processing that's going on. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I believe you could, you could simulate sort of a human brain on a classical digital supercomputer pretty mm -hmm. easily. Uh, pretty easily? Well, yeah, if you had a supercomputer that was that was uh, big enough and you knew the structural algorithms and things like that, I don't think there would be any surprises. There, there will be some issues, for example, people talk a lot about the synaptic, like the connectome, mm -hmm. there, but there are a lot of things like neurotransmitter modeling and that kind of stuff as well, that if you're mm -hmm. looking at artificial neural net approaches haven't really been thought about a lot yet. You have to go more down the blue brain end of the spectrum before people start thinking about that. Right. But I do think it's possible to build sort of faithful representations of brains uh, mm -hmm. in silicon. As, as for the, the quantum angle. Um, yeah, I mean, two colleagues of yours, one is colleague yeah. Sir Roger Penrose, I mean, very notable physicist, mm -hmm. genius in many ways. Uh, together with Dr. Stuart Hameroff, who have come up and proposed uh, the quantum theory of mm -hmm. consciousness. Yeah. So w yeah. w what about that? And is that fitting anywhere? You mean, are you at all like a critic or, or so, curious? Or, or at what level are you in with respect so to that? So my take on this is I, I am, I'm, I'm skeptical of that as a theory, but I'm also open-minded. And if it did, so, so okay, so two, there's two ways this can turn out. One, the, book, the brain is fully classical, and we don't need any quantum computers to simulate mm -hmm. it, um, which is great because we can simulate it. If, but, but then, see, if that happens, we then have these quantum computers that may then be able to build even more interesting brains that do work on these principles. A company called D-Wave, I think, somewhere. <laughs> is that? Yeah. yeah. So, so like my take on this is, you know, if the brain doesn't use quantum, then we can use quantum to maybe enhance it or make a new kind of brain, and that's kind of fun. And if it does use and if quantum, it does we use do quantum, have... we have we're building quantum computers, so we'll be able to simulate it. So either way, <laughs> it's the, like a win-win. The history of the brain is we are going to decipher it mm -hmm. one way or another. Whether yeah. it's quantum or not, yeah. there will yeah. be a point in time where we would know everything mm -hmm. of how it works. Yeah. And we can put one together and make it happen. Mm -hmm. There's nothing inherently that makes it uncomputable or... I don't think so. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of like chaotic stuff that goes on inside the brain from a mathematical sense of the word. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know, I'm always open-minded to think, okay, maybe there's something we just haven't considered. Some people uh, use the word usually stochastic or something. Yeah, yeah. Which makes But we it... can model stochastic processes too. And yes. it just seems very unlikely to me that there'd be some, something that's outside of our current knowledge of science mm -hmm. that means we can't uh, model a brain. Mm -hmm. It might be hard if it turns out that you need quantum physics or something, but I don't think it's, it would make it impossible. I mean, it's not just totally random, right? <laughs> There's structure in there. <laughs> Absolutely. And yeah. it fits with your kind of inherent optimism, I would say. And, and by the way, which is a 
prerequisite to be an entrepreneur, I think. Right, because uh, if yeah, you I don't so. believe yeah. against all evidence that you would succeed when you start being an entrepreneur, then you mm -hmm. would never start, would you? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. you have to have that kind of optimism in you. Um, what is a kind of a common misunderstanding or misperception or misconception that's something that you have to confront of perhaps often in your field and that you want to clarify once and for all? Um, well, I think maybe it's not a misconception so much as an, uh, something that hasn't people aren't aware of is the the big difference between like the classical way robots are programmed and the the new way in which they learn mm -hmm. so um one big misconception i find is that people think that robots um have to be very highly mechanical engineered to many like decimal places of precision and they have to be very robust and they have to be very uh, solid. They mm -hmm. have to have like no compliance because that's hard to model. And you have to create like very detailed simulations of them so right. you know exactly what your um, right. programs are doing. And then they're programmed uh, basically. Uh, they're told exactly what to do. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a mental model a lot of people have for robotics. That yeah. And, and that com comes along with that things like they're for heavy duty industrial tasks. They manufacture cars. Right. They're big, they're scary, they're expensive. And they're ugly. Um, yeah, and they're ugly. Or nothing like humanoid. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so that's kind of, I think, the mental model people have. The kind of robots we think of are more like, more like biological creatures. 3PO. So, yeah, although even C-3PO is kind of, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he, was, he was made to look a little like mechanical. Right. The sort of thing I'm talking about is like compliant tendons, that, things that stretch and bend like, like real right. biological creatures do, things that don't need five nines of precision because, you know, if you have one arm that's slightly longer than the other, it doesn't matter because your brain adapts to that. Right. Um, so as soon as you start building AI, in a way where you have a neural net that can adapt to whatever it's given mm -hmm. rather than you having to program in exactly or know the exact right. specs of that robot then that's much more flexible absolutely so I and think, adaptable yeah. yeah and it doesn't matter if your robots like say it's, its arm falls off or something it doesn't matter because the brain will become aware of that and the you know the robot may have a really huge pain signal but it's not going to stop trying to do what it was trying to do um, right, with. so that would enhance the survivability too of the yeah. system because when yeah. one part of the system fails, the rest of it ought to find a way to adapt to mm -hmm. and move on just like us humans yeah. do with yeah. our biological systems. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so very interesting. Yeah, I can see how that's extremely useful. Uh, let me ask you a little bit of a very different question outside of our realm of discussion so far. One that's very important to a percentage of my audience and one that my wife often reminds me of and that's women in technology right. and science. <laughs> You're one of probably half a dozen unfortunately women that mm -hmm. I've had on my show after 200 interviews. Right. <laughs> now I'm guilty of that but I do my best to get as many women as possible. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that's the case? Do you think I'm not doing a good job or do you think there's an issue in the field in general with gender equality or What's your take yeah, on that whole thing? It's a complicated topic. I think that I think opportunities are definitely getting better. So I think like the number of um, say kids in school that are now pursuing like say STEM careers, it's it's mm -hmm. it's evening out more. Um, but then I think once you get to once you get to university and beyond, the numbers start plummeting. Like I think that's why you find in industry, mm -hmm. you find that there's a lot. You end up having a lot more uh, guys in tech mm -hmm. than women. And I think part of it is to do with um, just the cultural stereotypes of like um, stay-at-home moms and things like that is still mm -hmm. very prevalent. So you know, if you want to have a family, then you have to really consider: do you want to keep pursuing this career? And yeah. a career in science and engineering and tech is really hard. <laughs> and it's I just don't. I know some people say you can have it all, but I'm just not. I don't. Not sure. I believe that. Like, mm -hmm. I think you have to choose. You have. We all have to make choices. Yeah. I, I think yeah. too. By the way, yeah. And I think just just in general, I think also um, there are like there are genetic differences between men and women, and I think just in general, 
girls don't tend to be as interested in science and mm -hmm. the boys do. So and I don't think there's anything we can really do about that because I think a lot of it is you innate. You don't think that's social in a way? I think it's somewhat social, but I don't think it's all Because, for example, social. boys get given Legos or, or yeah. bulldozers or guns and yeah. as toys and girls get given dolls. Yes. And, and I think... I, so I, I have a friend who um, has a daughter, and he says he never gave her any of the girly stuff at all. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they all got the same, there was no bias, and yet as she grew up, she started like pointing at the pink things and wanting to pick the, mm -hmm. the dolls. And so I think in some people, it's mm -hmm. probably mm -hmm. innate, mm -hmm. but... Yeah, it, it's just a very, very complicated subject. The University of Toronto now, I think, last couple of years, over 50%, maybe 51% of accepted graduates in the yeah. Department of Engineering were women. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one thing I do strongly believe in is that um, we should we should give like all girls a chance to find an interest in science and then nurture sure. it if it's there. So I was telling you the story about my father with the electronics and you know, yeah. maybe some people Waking would have been up in the middle like, of the Oh, now. she won't be interested in that. But no, he right. sort of uh, brought me along and said, Hey, to show you this. how you make a copper. Yeah. And I, uh, yeah. So circuit. I think there are things you can do like that. That's, uh, that's Absolutely. really nice. To, to create age. some magic, some, some, something, some interest, yeah. some curiosity. Yeah. There. And yeah. also there are, there are other things you can do like um, building robots these robots can be they can become anything from your imagination so you know even if you're interested in like dragons or horses or something there's some way that you can weave that in to uh, a science or a, a tech theme uh, you know clear example with gothic story. art into yeah. Yeah. theoretical physics and into artificial yeah. embodied intelligence mm -hmm. Wow. And that, that relates to one other thing I wanted to mention, which is um, something I think's maybe not wrong with the education system, but I think there's an alternate way to do it, which is I think like kids are taught, they're taught facts and they're taught about things without much context mm -hmm. of why they're learning these mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of doing a more top-down approach where you start with a problem and then you learn things as a result of, of having to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. So um, I remember doing a few things like this at school where, you know, we had to like build a, a bridge out of paper straws and you had to like solve the problems and things like this. But I mean, instead of teaching school kids things like uh, mechanics, um, mechanics in mathematics, why not get them to build uh, like a, a raceway with a car on and their, their project is to try and get the car to do the loop the loop. And mm -hmm. then in, in, in building this, they've got to figure out things like power to weight ratio. Right, what kind of speed. battery do I have to put yeah. in here? Gravity, friction, yeah, yeah. centripetal force, all these things wow. like come in. So, you know, in, in getting them to try and really think about how to solve a problem, yeah. you've taught them all these things without them even knowing it, yeah. as opposed to giving them all these equations and saying, you know, learn this. Yeah, and this is in keeping with my sort of philosophy of, of most things is that, you know, in a world where, and I, I even have it as a, as a flirt for a book title, but in a world where answers are free, questions are priceless. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the world is transformed by asking questions, you know, because answers, first of all, have an expiration date. They're good for a certain period mm -hmm. of time until the world around them changes yeah. and then they're no good anymore. And if we get stuck with an answer, then we go obsolete. But if we have that curiosity, that mm -hmm. love for the journey, for the question, for the pursuit of that question, then we would be okay with changing the answers and evolving with them and continuing on that ongoing process. Mm -hmm. And I think that's exactly what you're talking about. So yeah. Yeah. Um, I've been enjoying it tremendously. <laughs> Unfortunately, I know you have a big event tomorrow that you have to go to, so we'll have to bring our conversation <laughs> to an end. Let me ask you, for those of our viewers and listeners who are interested in finding more about Suzanne Gildert herself, or, and your art maybe, mm -hmm. or Kindred AI, what are the best places for mm -hmm. those to learn um, from? Yeah, so because we're de-stealthing at the moment, there's not actually much info available. The but website's it, not up yet. It is coming out very soon. Yeah. So if you go to kindred.ai, mm -hmm. that's the going to be the website for Kindred, and there'll be stuff being added over the next few months, hopefully mm -hmm. lots of interesting things about robots and AI. Mm -hmm. uh, my personal website, suzannegilder.com. 
Uh, again, currently it's a bit of a placeholder because of the stealth yeah. thing, but I'm going to be adding a whole bunch of things about art, uh, yeah. writing, life logging, and all these kind of things on that website. So I'd love if we can see a few more of your paintings. Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. And I'm particularly curious now about angels and demons uh, sort of theme mm -hmm. to see that. <laughs> that, that it, it, yeah, it, you know, I'm... I'm very, I love details like that. And, and I think they're actually very important, by the way. So at least that's, that's my, my take on it. But Suzanne, we've been talking today for maybe over an hour and a half, close to two hours, perhaps. What do you think is the parting message that you want to send us with? What, what's the most important thing that we should take today from this conversation with Suzanne Gildred from Kindred, founder and CTO of Kindred AI? I think it should be that that non-biological sentences are going to be coming soon. They're on the horizon already. And we should start thinking about what a world with those creatures in it might look like and how it might change us as a civilization. So we should just start considering it before it, before it happens. Non-biological sentences are on the horizon. Yes. Suzanne Gildred, thank you very much <laughs> Thanks, for your time today. Thank you. If you guys enjoy this show, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. You can go and write a review on iTunes or you can simply make a donation. 